Um, and thank you. Um, I would like to thank the organizers for putting together this uh, wonderful workshop and giving me the opportunity to talk today. And um, so as you all know, the art of data simulation is to um, bring together the information that comes from a model uh, together with the information that comes from observations. And um, the problem is this can be very difficult and I guess this is also the reason for this workshop that um, in certain scenarios if you for example have a highly nonlinear model which might even be chaotic and um, then you might also have a really high dimensional state space um, so I'm, I'm going to always uh, think of numerical weather prediction um, so thinking of state spaces 10 to the power of 8 and um, yeah in those scenarios Typically, um, you can also not afford to uh, run your model um, a lot of times, so you kind of can run it up to maybe 200, but that's basically it. And I know just, I mean, Peter Jan and also a lot of other people um, this week have been showing that nowadays you can go beyond um, Gaussian assumptions and there's many cool things happening. Um, they can um, also be applied maybe in the future for those kind of problems. But um, currently, what is happening in all the weather centers for America weather prediction is that mostly there is still some form of Gaussian assumption, and uh, they are either using some form of variation method or sequential methods that have this Gaussian assumption. So today, I'm going to focus on the sequential methods. And uh, <clears throat> so the thing is, um, uh, there's many of them with many difficult uh, to pronounce acronyms and I'm not going to go into detail of uh, the, the, very, uh, the different filters that work well in different scenarios but um, I will focus on the fact that they, they have this Gaussian assumption as one common thing and the other common thing, thing that they have is um, that they actually work quite well in practice um, although they have this underlying Gaussian assumption which is not um, true for the nonlinear models we're looking at. And <clears throat> the thing is um, that although they kind of work well in practice if you tune, tune them right, um, is that there's limited mathematical understanding why they work so well and it would be nice to have some actual rigorous analysis um, to show that they, they, uh, they are in some form accurate. And this is basically what I will talk today about. Um, <clears throat> so I will show you some results that we were able to derive. There's some um, other people who has been working on it, but um, there's not like the, the one answer out there yet. Um, so I'm going to quickly talk about the setting I'm going to consider. So um, I'm going to assume that my signal of interest is given by an SDE and um, that my ob uh, observations are also continuous or also given by an SDE. And <clears throat> of course, the ultimate goal in data simulation is to somehow estimate <coughs> the posterior distribution, uh, but uh, as we all know in this uh, settings I was just talking about, um, it's actually quite hard um, to find an, or you cannot find an analytic solution. I mean, what we do know is <coughs> that the evolution of this posterior dis density is actually given by the Krishna Stratonovich equation, but uh, this in itself uh, we cannot solve. And, <clears throat> but it is uh, helpful to know that uh, because we can, we can um, look at filters and see if we can mat match this, then we actually have a consistent filter. Um, I might actually talk about this in the end. But um, <clears throat> for now, uh, what people do is they say, okay, we cannot, we cannot get the true posterior distribution, so we kind of have to estimate it, and this is typically done in some form of Monte Carlo fashion. Um, so you approximate it with an ensemble or if you will with particles um, so for me ensemble methods are particle methods but um, <clears throat> um, depending on what community you come from we call it either ensemble or particle methods but the underlying idea is the same the only thing um, is in the ensemble community we also have the additional assumption that the posterior is Gaussian and <clears throat> um, so in the continuous, so I will be assuming uh, just that. So I'm assuming I can model it um, or approximate it in the Monte Carlo fashion. But then I also say, okay, I'm assuming it's a Gaussian distribution. 
And what I can derive then is the one variant of the ensemble Kamabusi filter. There's also other variants out there. So this variant I'm going to discuss today is basically re relating to the deterministic formulation of the Ian calf. So the ensemble square root uh, filter. And, uh, but of course you can also have variants where here in the innovation term have uh, additional um, stochastic noise and then it would uh, relate to the, the stochastic Ian calf. But today I'm going to focus on this one here. And for this filter, I, I will um, yeah, we'll show some accuracy results that we were able to derive. And I mean, the cool thing in the continuous version of this filter is that you can, so this is the underlying model equation with a slight um, change I will talk about in a second, but this is basically the underlying model equation, the SCE. And then you, you just have this uh, additional term, you have a modified evolution equation that basically already gives you the evolution of the particles um, um, that come from the posterior distribution, which is kind of neat. Um, <clears throat> and um, there's another thing, so we kind of, because usually here you have the, um, uh, the Brownian um, noise, uh, so what uh, we, we, we did, we did replace this noise uh, with the interacting particle representation. Um, <clears throat> the reason for that is actually um, to be able to prove something. Uh, but the nice thing in the Gaussian case, uh, in the limit you actually get the right thing, in all the other cases you actually don't, so it's an approximation um, at this part. But you kind of, what you want to have is you kind of want to have um, some form of noise and it's basically reflecting the noise that comes from the ensemble you're looking at. So, um, why this kind of filter? I mean, I'm now picking any filter, what's like the point, what, what, how is this valuable? Um, it's valuable because um, recently um, uh, Teresa Lange, who's a PhD student in our group, and William Standard were able to uh, show that a lot of the popular discrete filters in the time limit actually converge um, to this ensemble common busy filter we're looking at. So the results we have in the continuous case do directly relate to the filters such as ensemble square root filter and many others. So if you're, uh, if you're interested, see those two papers. Um, but this is restricting, um, I mean, in the first paper, they also looked at the stochastic version and looked at the limit there. Um, but um, uh, you would always only get this variant of the um, uh, Kalman Busi filter if you start off with the deterministic or the Kalman filter. But nevertheless, so this is kind of neat. All the results directly relate to the popular filters that are actually being used in the centers. And um, yeah, this is why we're looking at this ensemble comma for uh, Boosie filter. Um, just to make one point clear, because I talked about it in the beginning, so <clears throat> now we have this modified evolution equation, and what we can do is uh, look at the Fokker-Planck equation of this modified evolution equation, and uh, what we get is this, and if our filter w w was consistent, what we would get is the kushner stratonovich equation, which we don't. don't. Um, for this, uh, what I had to do first is, of course, because um, I'm, I'm going to consider the case where I have a finite number of ensemble members, and all the results we have are also for this case, um, because this is the case that is interesting uh, for, the apply, like for the application, because you always have a finite number of ensemble members. I mean, even, even if you have a consistent filter, what you need to look at is how well does it do for the finite uh, number of ensemble members. Um, so, yeah, so first we, we, you have to take the limit, of course, then you look at the Fokker Planck equation of this modified evolution equation, and you see it's not the Kushner Stratonovich equation, so it is not consistent. This is not big news because we had the, you, you basically had this underlying Gaussian assumption, but just to make this clear, of course, we, we don't have a consistent filter, but still we're hoping to show you some form of accuracy because in practice it does do well. So, um, of course, when you start to prove something, you always start off simple, and that's what we did. Um, <clears throat> so, um, there's like two very big assumptions. First of all, we assume that we observe everything, which of course is a very strong assumption. Um, to relax this assumption, you, um, you have to, uh, first of all, talk to experts like Edris. 
um, and uh, before that um, actually uh, look at a concrete model. So we, we try to look at a more general kind of model. We have some assumptions on our drift, um, but for, for the beginning we wanted to say could we observe everything. Um, <coughs> And then we also assume that the, the observational noise is somewhat small, which I guess is okay. Um, but then another really big assumption is that uh, for the first result, we actually said, okay, the number of ensemble members has to be larger than the state space, which, uh, as I pointed out in the beginning, is ridiculous because the state space is like 10 to the power of 8 and the number of ensemble members is more like 1 or 100 or 200. But uh, this is uh, what we started off uh, with. And um, <clears throat> so first, you have to ensure that your, um, your filter actually has solutions, uh, which, uh, which is not that difficult to show because we assume that our drift is Lipschitz. And, <clears throat> and further, what you need for that is that you kind of have some control over your covariance metrics. So in general, if you want to show some form of accuracy, um, you, you kind of need to ensure it, that your filter does not blow up or collapse. And to ensure this, you, you have to ensure that the covariance matrix um, is, has upper and lower bounds. Um, and this is exactly what we did. Um, and the important points to point out here are that the constants that um, uh, so the, the, uh, the bound is of or order epsilon, where epsilon, uh, or um, square root of epsilon, and the, the square root of epsilon is also what our observational noise is. And then we have two constants, and the constants actually depend on many things. First of all, the Lipschitz constant, then the number of ensemble members, um, then the, <coughs> um, the, the size uh, of the state space, the so dimension of the state space. And um, later we have some results where we at least get rid of the M because um, we had a different proof strategy. Here we went via the Frobenius norm and then you cannot get rid of the M. Um, but <coughs> um, we later can also relax this a little bit. Um, and yeah, the Lipschitz concept you don't get rid of. Um, but this was the, the, the first result, so we kind of were okay, we were able to somehow control it. And this might not seem like such a big result, but there's actually not that many results in, like even like in this simple setting out there. Actually, I mean, there is some stuff out there for if you localize and you have inf inflate, but this par particular version, we don't have any results like that out there um, for this kind of filter. So, and then, um, because this is just to, this before here was just to show, okay, it does not collapse, it does not blow up. And as soon as you have this result, you can look into accuracy. And by accuracy here, I mean <coughs> um, that you're basically able to track the solution to some extent. Um, because you, you cannot um, yeah, get the right distribution anyway, so um, this form of accuracy is already um, something you would like, uh, you're already good when you can do that. Um, so, <clears throat> first of all, we, for fixed T, we're able to show that the um, expected error is of order epsilon squared. Um, but then we also looked at um, uniform bounds. So, we, we were able to show that the, uh, we, um, the uniform error for um, a fixed time interval is also of order epsilon squared, which is kind of nice. Um, so there is some form of accuracy. And um, then, just because uh, it's always nice to also have a picture, so if you have rigorous proofs for this, so we actually don't need to confirm this necessarily numerically, but of course we looked at uh, the numerics and show, looked at the Lorentz 63 system, and saw, okay, yeah, if we change the, the order of the measurement uh, noise, then uh, the accuracy also behaves in a similar fashion, and this is what we were able to show. So, but um, for the Lorentz 63, because it's three-dimensional, um, by the assumptions of the, the proofs, we kind of uh, at least required three um, ensemble members. But then we also wanted to see, okay, what if we have two ensemble members? Of course, they, they have to uh, do, do a little bit of tricks because um, your uh, covariance matrix will become singular. But um, you, you also kind of get the same order or the kind of, um, the same behavior, so that gave us hope. Okay, let's look. Let's do the next step and tackle um, one problem, uh, like um, 
relax one of the assumptions. And the, the one re uh, assumption we wanted to relax first was that the number of ensemble members is larger than the state space because that was a very strong assumption. And in practice, what is typically done, because in practice you also have this issue that then um, your um, covariance matrix does not, is not um, uh, in any way regular. Um, so you kind of <coughs> have to make up for this. And what is typically done is two things. People localize uh, and they also inflate the ensemble because you, so you ensure that it does not collapse. Um, so what we will do is uh, we localize. Um, we did not actually have to inflate to get the similar results. So how do we localize? So we localize in two, two ways because, uh, I don't know if I have it on the next slide, but so um, I have to go back, sorry, to show you where it actually enters. So here we actually have the, the inverse entering. And here we localize differently than here in the covariance matrix. So what we did here is we just said, okay, we replace the, um, we replace the inverse of the covariance matrix uh, by its diagonal inverse. So we just, uh, everything was set to zero but the diagonal and there we just took the, the um, inverse of the diagonal elements. Um, for this to be, uh, it does not have to be, uh, the function, uh, the matrix does not have to be uh, positive definite but uh, positive semi-definite for this. Um, and the next other thing we did, I mean, um, oh yeah, actually, I didn't have to go back. I actually had the slide, so you, we brought this in. And here we localize, um, just as you typically know it, you assume, okay, things that are far away somehow don't affect, um, like observations that are far, far away don't affect states um, um, that um, are far away from this. So um, we basically just use this form of localization, although you could actually also match the things that are further away, that just depends on how you choose your localization function. But at least you assume that you have a reduced number of influencing um, um, coordinates in your state space. Yeah, um, but um, we did not actually focus on a specific localization. The only thing that we assumed is that, first of all, the drift uh, also, because for this to actually to make sense, you also need your drift to have this kind of property um, that you only have short range interactions. So this was one assumption. And then um, we did not pick a specific um, localization scheme, but what uh, needs to be uh, true is that um, it's kind of the uh, matrix you use to um, localize has to be a diagonal dominant, which is actually not a bad assumption either because you can fix your localization scheme to fulfill this. And um, for this particular setting then, we were also again able to show that the covariance matrix does not blow up or collapse um, <clears throat> and that strong solutions to the filter exist. Uh, and we again have uh, bounds of order epsilon squared. And also if you, if you ensure that the, the initial covariance, so the, uh, the initial ensemble gives you a covariance matrix, empirical covariance matrix um, that is um, larger than zero in the norm, um, then um, the evolution of this um, ensemble will also always be in a way that uh, the co empirical covariance matrix also in the norm is always larger than zero, which is good. Um, so we, that's why we, don't, we were able to show this without inflating, so that's kind of neat. Um, then in terms of error, we were again able to sh uh, also show that the expected error for a fixed uh, time um, is of order epsilon squared. It still depends on the um, size of the state space, uh, but it does not depend anymore on the number of ensemble members. And uh, then additionally, we were able to show the some form of uh, or some Laplace type condition. And again, we were able to show the uniform error. And um, the unit in the earlier result I showed you, uh, of course, it also depended on the, <coughs> the capital T. Um, and we were, we were able to uh, derive a better bound. So now uh, we have the logarithm of T before we had actually had dependence on T in the constant. And, <coughs> um, and this time what we also wanted to find out, so this all depends on the number, uh, the dimension of the state space. But what we wanted to understand is um, how is the 
uh, error distributed across space because it could be that you have some um, components that have a very large error um, or it's actually uniform distributed and we were able to show that it is in fact uniform distributed so we looked at the different components and if you look at the different components you can actually get rid of the dependency of the constants on the dimension of the state space. Um, yeah, and so we got similar result, a Laplace type condition, and also this form of uniform um, error. But uh, yeah, what, what is missing here is the dependency on the dimension of the state space. And um, yeah, we also, of course, <laughs> looked at this numerically. Uh, this time we chose a Lorentz 96 because it's high dimensional. And um, the localization scheme, just to give you an idea, we, uh, we just used the Gaspari Cohen function. Um, I mean, again, it's not necessary uh, for the proof to uh, pick a specific one. Um, uh, the only thing we had to ensure is this, uh, that the matrix is then uh, diagonal dominant. And I think in the, uh, for the Gaspari cone, we had to choose localization radius uh, 1.4, which is not large, of course, uh, but you can make up for it by tuning the matrix in a different way. But just by choosing um, localization radius uh, 1.4, you already get the assumption you need without doing any extra work. So that's what we picked. And <clears throat> we actually saw the order of the error we wanted. Uh, so again, if you increase the measurement error, we see this, that it goes um, with the asylum uh, squared. And then we also wanted to see, because we now have an improved um, dependency on T, so we kind of wanted to see that it behaves like the log logarithm, um, which it kind of did. And then if you increase the number of ensemble, uh, the, the, um, the uh, uh, size of the state space, I'm sorry, you cannot see it well, but we started off with 40 and then went to 1,040 uh, in terms of dimension. And of course, the error grows if you just look at the normal um, uniform bound um, for a fixed time interval. But then if you just look at the individual components, it actually does not increase with the dimension. And this is exactly what I was talking about that um, the, um, the error in space is uniform distributed. So yeah, we were able to also uh, show that in the numerics. And um, the only things I wanted to mention now is, so of course we don't want to stop here, there's much more work to be done. Um, one nice thing is in the results, so because what people often do is, um, in the ensemble square root uh, filters, they multiply with the um, rotation matrix um, to improve the results and some, sometimes it actually works very well and we wanted to see how if you start off with a discrete filter what does the continuous counterpart look like um, and then can we actually do is are all the results the same or do we have to change something or do we get the same things then of course it would be nice to go more into the partially observed direction for that we actually look, have to look at a concrete model um, but the good thing then is maybe we can get rid of the, uh, something like the Lipschitz um, um, assumption because you can look at dissipative uh, systems and um, um, if you have a concrete model you can actually use the properties of that model and maybe get rid of some other assumptions. And um, then another thing we're actually working on is we don't actually only want to look at um, the Gaussian assumption case but also at some of the particle filter uh, was, that are out, out there. So we also have a particle filter that is, seems to be promising in terms of high dimension. And we also want to understand how well does it actually do or what can you show for the finite um, um, ensemble member case because of course it's consistent in the limit but who knows uh, what the results are actually like or what can you can show for the finite case. And uh, the next thing would actually be also to look um, at the scenario where you do a simultaneous state and parameter estimation, because right now we're just doing state estimation. And yeah, thank you so much. Thank you very much for this nice talk, Jana. Uh, Jana, sorry. <laughs> so questions or comments on, on the talk? So maybe I can start. So how many uh, particles did you use for the Lorentz system there? I, um, that's actually good. Hang on, I, th I think I have it in the... Oh, no, I actually don't. Uh, I think it was um, like the re very low, like we tried 10 and then it goes up to dimension like 10 or 20, I think. Yeah. Okay. I'm, I'm not 100% sure. So I think that, yeah. 
definitely yeah. smaller than, I mean, even for dimension 40, we went much lower than the okay, dimension. The dimension of the system. Yeah. Other questions, comments? Um, I'm sorry, I'm not f really familiar with some of these terms, but could you explain what a Gaspari cone function is? I've never heard of that before. Uh, it's just a popular localization function, and all it does is like, e things that are close get a higher weight, uh, and um, if, the r like, if you choose a small localization radius, basically everything becomes zero that is further than away than this localization radius. It's just one function that also has some neat properties and it's very popular. But also there's people out there who claim that it's rubbish. So I mean, it's a popular function, but yeah. Okay, so thanks. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, let's thank again Jana.